everybody, Eric here, and I am really stoked for today's guest. So we have Natalie here, and I came across her like quite a few people on Twitter, except um, she has a lot of really awesome Bitcoin and cryptocurrency kind of uh, content. So I'm really excited to, to have you here. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to it. Awesome. So first off, I think it's always really helpful just to level set. Obviously, it's your first time with us on the channel. So um, I thought it would be really cool just to explore your background very quickly so people understand your perspective, your paradigm. So really two main questions. The first question is, um, obviously, you are very focused on Bitcoin cryptocurrency space. Uh, so the first question is, what got you interested in that space? Sure. So uh, a little bit about my background. I'm a first generation immigrant. My family came to the U.S. Uh, when I was very little from Poland and my mm. family wanted to. Another Polak. Sorry. Yeah. I get oh, are you Polish? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> is my last name. So. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I was born there and came when I was very little. We immigrated to Chicago where uh, pretty much every Polish person moves when they come to the U.S. And uh, my parents came in search of the American dream. They grew up under communism. So mm -hmm. they are really passionate about a sense of freedom, especially economic freedom and the ability to move upwards uh, for uh, social mobility. And so they thought that America would have a lot more opportunity and provide myself and my brother with a better um, education system and just, you know, more chances to kind of improve our lot in life and be able to accomplish what we want to accomplish and, and become financially secure. So that was always drilled in my head, right? Like it was just this idea that it, you should work hard, you should get an education and you, and you can make it like America is right. the place where you have the chance to become whatever you want to become and you can earn money and take care of your family. Um, and they didn't want something extreme. They didn't want to become, you know, Jeff Bezos sure. with a yacht. They just wanted like that middle-class life of a, a nice house, uh, in a safe suburb, but you know, a vacation every year and their kids to go to, to go to good school. So, um, I saw them work really, really hard when, when we came here and they worked so hard that we were able to finally afford a house. And then the financial crisis happened in 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. and they lost everything. Uh, and yeah. I had, I watched them start over again. And, um, so I think back then there was like something instilled in my head of like, how did this happen? You know, they were two good working, good, good, hardworking people who paid their taxes, played by the rules, and they got completely screwed by a system that they didn't even fully understand. And I always wondered, like, why, you know, why didn't we see that coming? Why did this even happen? How could the greatest, you know, the economy in the greatest country in the world suddenly have, um, you know, its economy on the brink of collapse, its banking system on the brink of collapse and needing bailout from the taxpayers. And I, that was just sort of, you know, ruminating in the back of my mind. And I decided to pursue a career in journalism because I've always loved storytelling and learning and interviewing people. I love conversations. And so I set off right around that same time around the financial crisis. I got my first job and I started working in this news industry, which was changing uh, in real time because of technology and mm -hmm. allowing people to, you know, become their own personalities from home and have YouTube channels and all the right. things that um, didn't exist when I was growing up, sort of dreaming of becoming a journalist. And so what that taught me is, um, you know, I spent 10 years as a reporter looking at the crises that are, are facing this country at a really, really deep micro level of human experience, you know, interviewing people that are facing poverty, homelessness, the politicians who claim to have the answer, elections, uh, public corruption, mm -hmm. all of it. And what I ended up realizing is that our system is really broken and we're spending more and more money and the problems are only getting bigger and everyone blames someone else. And really for the average person, life is getting more and more expensive to afford everything from housing to education. And um, it made me kind of frustrated because I didn't understand what the solution was. And I started to feel as I, as I progressed in my career that really nothing changes it. Um, right. And then I learned about Bitcoin. Uh, and it was 2017. I was in one of the news markets that I worked in and I had friends of friends who worked at Coinbase and they were kind of investing in crypto. And I was like, what is Bitcoin? And just like most people, I was super skeptical. I thought it was a scam. I thought it was, you know, some internet funny money. Uh, I didn't believe in it. I didn't understand it, but I was curious. And I, I ultimately knew that there was a problem and supposedly this was a technology that might fix some of the problems we have. So I started to dig into it. Candidly, I did not do most of my research until the pandemic. 
and uh, and our market crashed and they right. initiated like the bazookas of money printing. And, uh, and I knew that life was not going back to the same sort of financial world order that we had before. I felt like everything changed with the pandemic. And so I started to consume everything I possibly could, not just about Bitcoin, but about our economy in general, like the history of the Federal Reserve. And, you know, I started following gold bugs, Bitcoin people, um, people who were talking about, you know, macroeconomics and what happened in the financial crisis and what happened in 1971 with the gold standard. And I started to realize that all of the problems that both I experienced with my family coming here and losing everything, as well as all the problems that I was really reporting on as a journalist, they were all connected to our money and how broken our money system was. And that Bitcoin is the one thing to me that I think could fix it and could uh, usher us into a new financial order that's more inclusive, that's more based on value and, and is more equal because it's it's based on actual supply and demand economics, which we haven't had for a very long time with the manipulated interest rates and quantitative easing that the, the Fed takes part in. So I know this is a very long-winded answer, but basically I came to Bitcoin because I knew there was a problem. And when I learned about Bitcoin, I realized that was the solution. And I want to empower people to understand it so that they can opt out of the broken system into one that potentially could help them accumulate wealth and take care of their families in the future. Wow. <laughs> that it's That's kind of incredible. One, obviously, I just think it's freaking awesome that your parents are fellow Polacks. Like I said, I, I get giddy when I find others. Um, but the the story that you share is is kind of fascinating to me for a few reasons. One, obviously, their timing in just the U.S. market was a little rough because 2008 was just brutal, and you know, obviously, you know more about it than I do. You know, just the way that our fiscal policy was set up at that point, obviously, it just gives so much leeway to these banks. And you started, you know, the the aftermath. You're reviewing what kind of monetary decisions they're making. You're like. Who like who, who who thought this was a good idea? You know what I mean? So yeah. it's it's interesting how that moved you towards Bitcoin. So the very first um, kind of follow on question I have for you is when we're thinking about the current, uh, you know, just monetary policy, the way that the Fed is so involved in our current fiscal policy, what do you think Bitcoin does in order to kind of fix that problem, obviously understanding a little bit of the construction, but I'm curious, you know, just at a, at a high level overview, what your thoughts are there. Yeah. So put very simply, it takes the power of money out of the hands of government and central authority. And that's what I think we need right now. Um, I didn't really understand the history of money. I never learned it in school. I think this is, you know, it puts a highlight on how little financial literacy we have in this country. I, I went to good schools. I graduated with a master's at one of the top universities, and I really never understood the history of money or how the Federal Reserve came to be. And these are fundamental things that affect all of our lives, right? We use right. money every single day. It is, you know, our most important information system, I would say. Um, it allows us to measure value in society for everything that we produce and all the services that we provide. And our money is broken and our money doesn't have actual value. It's collapsing and purchasing power. And we don't even know what the true price of things are when you have a federal reserve that manipulates interest rates and pumps liquidity into markets by basically creating money out of thin air. And then yep. that money goes, it gets disproportionately allocated to, you know, the big corporations and they do stock buybacks and they buy up all this real estate and make everyone into renters. And it's just, it's ballooning the wealth inequality in our country. And so mm. It's just what's sad to me is that I didn't realize that the policies that I was learning in school were really backwards. Um, they were basically addressing solutions as opposed to the problems and yeah. or, um, the symptoms, excuse me. Right. They were addressing the symptoms as opposed to the actual problem. And the problem is they're debasing our currency. They're debasing our money. They have the prerogative to print as much money as they want. And it affects the average person, the middle class, the, the low income earners, the savers. It affects them so much. And that that's what my family represented. And it's frustrating to me. It makes me angry. And so I want people to be empowered with that education of like, look, we used to have a money that they could not inflate. It was gold. And then gold got centralized in vaults and they issued more paper notes than the gold that they had. And eventually they 
let that get away so far that that we basically defaulted and had to go off the gold standard. And now we're in this fiat world where they can make as much money as they possibly want. It goes into the hands of the wealthy before anybody else. And we are getting poorer and more polarized as a nation. We used to be the world's biggest creditor nation. Now we're the world's largest debtor nation. We don't make anything. We don't make anything of value here. And that's sad. Um, and so I now see why everyone is, you know, there's so much angst and it's like red versus blue. Everyone has a team because everyone's just feeling frustrated by a system that isn't inclusive and isn't fair. And no matter how hard you work, it's like, you're always on this in the rat race or on this gerbil, gerbil wheel and you can't make enough and you can't retire and you have to start gambling your money and meme stocks, right. And altcoins. So this is the system that Bitcoiners want to fix. Like Satoshi Nakamoto put into the first, you know, block, uh, the Genesis block, the, the, um, headline, chancellor on brink of second bailouts. Like this is the exact problem he wanted to fix or she wanted to fix is the idea that central authority has way too much power and control over the supply of money. And as soon as they start printing too much money and debasing our currency, everybody suffers in the end. So um, yeah, Bitcoin fixes that. <laughs> it's interesting. So one of the questions I have with regards to that, I agree with you really on the vast majority of those um, issues that you noted. Now, one thing I am curious your perspective on, though, is so are you of the opinion that really in general, the government should not manipulate its financial policy, its currencies at all? Or do you think they should limit their involvement? And the reason why I ask that is I do think in certain circumstances, government intervention has actually worked for us and has made some circumstances a little less uh, I guess impactful um, overall. I guess to, you know, depending on how you perceive the impactful comment. But I'm just curious. Like, do you think that going from something where the government is so heavily involved, because right now I think it's way too much, to something where essentially there's no government involvement? What do you think about that jump? So that's a great question. I believe in the rule of law, but I believe in that the government should not be intervening in the free markets and in the economy. And so this is where, again, Bitcoin is the reason why I learned about the, these different economic theories. Before Bitcoin, I never understood what Keynesian economics versus Austrian right. economics were. And, and, and I feel like over even just the last like five to 10 years, when I think about the stories I've covered or just like um, just the, the, the climate in general, when it comes to the word capitalism has really changed. Like capitalism has turned into a very negative word. It's, it's yeah. associated with greed and with wealth yeah. inequality. But the truth yeah. is, is if you really study capitalism, capital capitalism is about capital accumulation. It's about saving and investing. And it, it is the complete polar opposite of what everyone is told to do in this country, which is spend that the, that the right. health of an economy in this country is based on the level of spending. And so Keynesians believe that the government should intervene and that the government is responsible for stepping in and basically managing demand. They can manage, um, actions of human beings. They can manage unemployment. They can stimulate the economy. They can pre prevent these booms and bust cycles, but arguably we've had decades of Keynesian economics and all we've had is booms and busts because the economy can't regulate itself. And so that's what really frustrates me is there, there's a school of thought out there that's being completely ignored and not being taught in schools, which is Austrian economics, which really focuses on free markets and capitalism and encourages people to save and then invest in something productive and create value for the economy. And we push all of that aside in favor of taking on debt and, and consumerism and spending. And so I, I truly believe, like the Austrians believe, that if we had an economy that was based on free markets and an interest rate that basically set itself based on supply and demand as opposed to a central bank, that we would actually have more equilibrium in the economy. We would have fewer booms and busts that weren't as extreme because the market would come in and fill those gaps and holes. Whereas the government, I think, encourages malinvestments and misallocation of capital because they ultimately can't decide human action. They can't, you can't just like, spend your way into a healthy economy. And we've gotten so into debt using Keynesian economics. I mean, we're basically pushing, putting the tab on future generations and look what's happening. Now a millennial doesn't feel like they can even afford a house that their parents could. That is not the way America should function. Like we're supposed to be, you know, 
the paradigm of capitalism and free markets and enterprise and entrepreneurship. And now we're leading into what I believe is almost a system of authoritarianism because we have politicians mm-hmm. coming in and saying, hey, this is based on corporate greed. I'm gonna ha- we're going to have universal basic income. This is the bad guy. I'm the fix. We're going to spend more money. We're going to hand out money. That's not the solution. The solution is allowing free markets to function, in my opinion. And I think with hard, sound money that can't be manipulated at the base layer of our economy, something like Bitcoin using technology to harness sound money, that is what I think will allow us to have a more equal economy. It's interesting. So one of the things you noted, um, and I'm, I'm just curious to dive in just a little bit further, is you, you mentioned something to the order of the market being able to kind of fill some of, you know, just the, the holes that we're experiencing um, in the current marketplace. When you're referring to the market, I'm curious who that is to you, because one of the, I guess, as I'm listening and synthesizing what you're saying, one of the concerns that I have in that kind of world is institutions really drive most of the marketplace right now. The retail investor has you know, pennies to the dollar. So I'm curious how you view the the markets in terms of who then starts to assume kind of pricing power and, you know, controlling supply and demand. Yeah. And so this is where I believe that we don't have capitalism. We have crony capitalism where we're allowing sort of these big mass production, mass, mass corporation entities to rise up and control our economy and our government and sit in the, you know, the pockets of politicians, because that's Mm -hmm. what essentially fiat does. Because when the federal reserve buys treasury bonds or they make up, you know, dollars through on their, in their electronic system, that money goes first to the most credit worthy entities. It doesn't go to small businesses. It doesn't go to the average person. It goes to massive corporations. What have they been doing over the last two decades? They buy back their stock and their stock prices go up, but it's not based on value or you know revenue or the company actually making great new products. It's based on the fact that they're buying back their shares and the CEOs are getting richer right. and richer. And so again, like this is not an economy of value. It's based on ballooning asset prices. And so everything looks like it's great, but like the asset prices, we're in a, when we're in a very expensive stock market right now, right? S&P 500 went up, what, 30% last year. I would argue that's closer to the rate of inflation that we actually have. House prices went up 30%, if not more in certain cities. How can the average person afford a new house? Great that you get to sell your place for 30% more, but now you have to buy a place that's 30% more expensive, right? There's no winner in this unless you just have a bunch of homes you're selling. And so again, I just think that this leads to this wealth gap just increasing, increasing, increasing because in a system of money printing and in a system of fiat, the people who have assets, the people who have the big corporations and can get easy money loans, they're the people that win in, in this. And then the average saver, the average middle-class person is getting robbed through inflation. Everything around them is more expensive. They can't save. School's more expensive. Housing is more expensive. And they don't have access to this easy money. Uh, so I just think the system is just getting more and more broken. And because people don't understand the system and how money printing works, they don't really understand it. I mean, prior to, you know, I don't know, maybe the pandemic, did, how many people actually thought about the Fed interest rates? Panda- like, unless right. you were in the finance market, we're, we're in a hyper financialized world now. Not many average people thought about it, but today inflation is one of the main headlines because they've printed the majority of the money that's in circulation in just the last two years. So I hopefully right. think, you know, people are waking up to it, but you can't have a system like that because it, it really disadvantages the average person, the saver, the worker, like the families that make up, I believe the backbone of our country, small business owners, all of that. It's an interesting perspective. I, and I agree with you, especially the, the comment on kind of, I don't know, I would almost call it the bastardization about fiat currency at this point, the, the way that it's being deployed. Um, I completely agree with you there. When I think about, you know, the integration of Bitcoin and the ability for a place like the United States, we're starting to see some integration here or there. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on that in terms of what needs to happen for widespread Bitcoin integration into the U.S. economy. So I just think it's about education. And I think that the the market movers in terms of Bitcoin price are going to be when the institutions come in. And again, all of this, I think, is about education. Michael Saylor uh, obviously was a, a big name over the last two years. He learned about Bitcoin because of the pandemic and the devaluing 
um, currency that he had in his reserves and in his treasury, he couldn't figure out where to put his money because bonds right. with inflation are yielding negative rates at this point. And yep. um, so basically, what are you going to do? Where are you going to put your money? And he makes these great analogies of the fact that, you know, it's like the oxygen is getting sucked out of the room and you're, br you're breathing less and less every single year. Your, your money is a melting ice cube. And until Bitcoin, there really was no solution. Um, and then Bitcoin drops out of the air like this oxygen mask. And it's like, aren't you going to put it on? I mean, this is the best performing monetary asset of the last 10 years. But more than that, it is the most powerful computer network in the world. I mean, this is essentially... Mm the internet of money. It's completely decentralized. There's no point of failure. There's no CEO you have to worry about. There's no politics. It's literally just a system that has created a mutually beneficial uh, incentive program that almost harnesses greed for good and is decentralized so that no, no person can control it. Everyone sort of benefits if they adopt it. And through network effect, it's grown to be the most powerful cryptocurrency in the world. And I think when you, you know, when you look at inflation rates, not just in this country, but obviously far worse than others, it's like, where do you put your money today that it's going to be safe? Uh, can you, can you afford to buy a house? I mean, you can, I, I can put $5 into Bitcoin. Can you buy $5 of real estate in New York? No. <laughs> right? right. Um, this is securing your property rights in a way that is not it's censorship resistant. It is not able to be confiscated. It is open software that anyone can see every transaction validated and recorded all the way to the beginning of the blockchain. I mean, it's truly incredible technology. Um, and so I, I believe that if people sort of opt out of the system, start putting their money into Bitcoin, they'll see it go up in value. It's a baby monetary network. So yes, there's short-term volatility, but over the long run, it's literally running upwards as opposed to the purchasing power of your dollar, which is collapsing every single year and melting at a rate of between 7% is what they tell you. But I believe it's closer to 20 to 30% every year. Are you getting a 20 to 30% raise? Where are you going to put your money? Not in a savings account that has a 0.01% interest yield. Are you going to gamble it on stocks? Well, which stocks? Do you want to put it all on Apple? What are you going to buy? Like, where do you put your money today? It's not safe. And so I believe that Bitcoin offers us this great savings technology and store of value and immaculate digital property that's scarce that no one can take from you. And I think it's incredible. So an interesting phrase that you use that I'm curious about is you say that it's safer. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'd love to dive into that a little bit more. And the reason for that is... When I think about safety, one of the things I would consider is obviously reduction in variance, reduction in return volatility. And like you said, right now, we are in a world where the only way to get a positive real rate of return is via equity markets or, you know, something else like, you know, an alternative like Bitcoin. And when I think about um, some of the conversation around Bitcoin, I can see the long term safety um, it, depending on how adoption goes, but, you know, I also look at a asset that in the last, you know, six months went from what 69,000 and right now it's hanging at like 41, 480, something like that. So to me, I think about safety and I'm like, well, you know, wait a minute, that's cut by a third and change. So how is that safer to you? Yeah. So I think safety and volatility are two different things. Um, mm safety to me with Bitcoin kind of refers to the fact that I now have a form of property that no one can take away from me that I can Got take okay. anywhere in the world. And I can transfer value from any, from myself to any part of the world in a matter of minutes. And no one, no one can take that power away from me. You can't, you can't take the, the seed phrase out of my head. Right. right As opposed right. to um, this didn't happen with my family, but I've heard so many stories of people who fled Eastern European countries during communism, and they could only take with them to the U S or wherever they were fleeing a hundred U S dollars worth of whatever they had. Um, that's right. all they could take. Well, what if they had Bitcoin L recently when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, I heard amazing, incredible stories of the people who had Bitcoin were able to pay for evacuations or escape the country while the banks were closed or there was a run on banks and the traditional finance system collapsed when the Taliban took over and Bitcoin was a way that they could still transact and, and basically pay for their families to have an escape. I mean, it's, it's literally in real time, empowering people with both financial freedom as well as human rights. And so I think that that's incredible. Is it a volatile asset? 
Absolutely. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's in the baby stages of monetization. It is a brand right. new monetary network. And, you know, in different countries, it's also, it has different tax implications and you could trade it in and out of the highs and lows in places like Dubai or UAE, and you get no tax penalty. And here in the, in the U S like we're, if you hold, you want to hold cause you don't want to face capital gains tax, right? Taxes. Right. So we're in the baby stages of monetization, but I would prefer to have an extremely volatile appreciating asset that year over year is just going up in value as opposed to an extremely stable, not volatile at all asset like cash, which is collapsing in value over the last several years, right? right? So I can stomach the volatility and I get that people need to, you know, use their fiat money for everyday expenses and a lot, you know, not a lot of places even accept Bitcoin. And I would argue you want to hold something that's increasing in value, but ultimately I see it as a safer place because I don't have to worry about a CEO. I don't have to worry about some, you know, some product having good or bad performance, supply chain issues. I don't have to worry about a certain politician getting elected. It's, it's just is what it is. It's a computer network that allows us to store our monetary energy in a place that has outperformed everything else that exists and that is controlled by no one and that no one can manipulate because there's a finite amount secured by this decentralized network. So I don't know if that answers your question, but like it for does. me, safety is like not about its volatility. Yeah, no, it does. And that really, I'm actually really stoked that you took the conversation in that direction, just because I've talked to some different people with varying concept of, you know, again, safety. And I always feel like that's an important differentiate to make. And I think the way that you phrase that, I totally agree with that. That makes total sense to me. And especially because sometimes what frustrates me with some of the Bitcoin conversations is some people don't like to admit that it's super volatile short term. And then it, market just closed. Um, but then it makes, you know, it almost makes the rest of the conversation kind of hard to like really conceptualize. So I, I think that that's a really, really great way to highlight, you know, the, the safety concept for something like Bitcoin. I agree with you there. I think that's a great, a great way to phrase it. Um, so being mindful of your time, I do have two more questions. The first one is looking into 2022, mm -hmm. what, what is it, what is, you know, what happens to Bitcoin? Do you see more adoption coming, especially with the Fed coming out with this interest rate manipulation? You know, we're expecting three to four rises starting as soon as March. Like, I'm just curious at a very high level, what do you think is going to happen to Bitcoin throughout the rest of this year? Yeah, so um, I have really high hopes for Bitcoin hitting new all-time highs because ultimately I do think that it's still co correlated in some way to the traditional markets and liquidity. And mm. what I hope everyone is learning over the, the last at least year or two is that our economy is basically addicted to quantitative easing and stimulus. Uh, it's addicted to the money printer. And yep. as soon as they try to let off the gas pedal, everything tanks, right? And goes into the red. And so um, unfortunately, our Fed is now between a rock and a hard place because we have so much debt and we can't service that debt if they raise interest rates meaningfully to a place where they right. probably should raise interest rates. They would cause a complete credit collapse and you know bankruptcies and the unwinding of this massive leverage that we have that's historic, that's a much bigger bubble than we had in 2008. Uh, but if we go the other way and we keep printing, then it's just devaluing our currency more, but it obviously makes it cheaper to service our debt. So pretty much I, I believe that they're going to go by way of inflation. They're going to give us the headlines of inflation's good. And this is why it's good. Oh, oh, now we're going to have price controls and they're going to try well, to fix transitory things. transitory by... inflation, right? Exactly. Yeah. Now we're seeing, <laughs> the, you know, we're seeing the narrative that, you know, now we're going to potentially have uh, price fixing and wage controls, right. which it's like, it's, it's sad because it's clear that most people who are leading this country politically don't understand basic economics and the times in history when people tried that and it really didn't work. Right. <laughs> so, um, so what I believe will happen is I believe they will talk about tapering. They might try to raise, you know, a couple basis points. They won't be able to, uh, we have an election coming up. We are going to have to have green markets for that. What's that going to mean? More money printing, more devaluing of our currency. I think that that's going to help Bitcoin. Anything with liquidity is going to help Bitcoin. And anytime that people realize that this system is just too far gone at this point, we're insolvent and we're addicted to the money printer and we're just going to keep debasing our currency. Bitcoin is a fantastic technology that opts us out. And I think more and more people will adopt that both institutions and retailers 
I'm so happy and grateful that we have this technology. And so I think Bitcoin, you know, once the markets are, to, are given the green light from the Fed that no more tapering is going to happen, I think they're going to run. And I think Bitcoin's going to run with it. Interesting. Yeah, I, that I think, um, I mean, when I think about Bitcoin, though, it's kind of boring, right? Because Big Daddy J-Pal can't just turn on the printer and then just print Bitcoin. So <laughs> what? Where, where's the entertainment now? No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> they but, should print money to buy Bitcoin. That's, a good <laughs> um, that's an interesting, it's an interesting outlook and it highlights really my last question. And it's something that I'm just personally curious about. I find that we always, at least as traders, we're always looking for relationships and correlations and how things interact with other things. And Bitcoin is a tricky one because for a while, a lot of people saw it as an inflation hedge. And then some people are saying, well, is it really an inflation hedge? So that's really the, the last nuanced question I have for you is how do you think Bitcoin interacts with, directly with interest rates? Do you think that it's something people can slowly add to the portfolio as a style of hedge? Do you think that they're too just disjointed for that to really be an observable relationship at this point? What does that look like to you? For me, and I said this recently in a news uh, show that I was a part of, I believe that Bitcoin is a fantastic inflation hedge. And I think that an, a non-zero position is the right one for everyone at this point. And everyone has different um, amounts of risk and volatility they can stomach, but I believe at least a one to 5% is smart for everyone. <laughs> and mm, I, okay. and I really try to educate as many people about it as possible, because at this point, it is literally the best performing monetary asset of the last decade. It's appreciated about a million percent. The second best performer was Tesla at 15,000%. Amazon and Apple stocks were about 14, 12, 12 and 1400 respectively. S&P 500 did about uh, 300% over the last decade. Gold went down about 6%. So it's not the inflation hedge that I suppose it once no. was. Um, yeah. But let's look at the last couple of, just the last couple of years. 2019 was around 90% that Bitcoin went up. Uh, 2020, 300%. Last year, 60%. Inflation, yes, they're telling us it's 7%, but let's look at how much assets have gone up. Let's look at the S&P. Let's look at how much housing has gone up by. That's what I believe tells the real story of inflation. Tell 7% tell to the person going to, to gas and paying you know 40% more at the pump or paying 25% more for right. their meat at the supermarket. Inflation is a massive problem. We're being misguided and misinformed about it by the media, which is really sad. I, I come from a journalism background. We should be watchdogs for the government. We shouldn't be lapdogs and propagandists for the government and their policies, we should be really holding their feet to the fire. And so I think that the inflation um, narratives, you know, we need to, we need to actually inform people about how this is really hurting them at, in their bottom lines. And the stimulus right. checks are just like a little crumb, you know, in all of the, uh, in all I of think the it's a distraction. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a distraction. Yep. Totally. I, I think that's just to CSG people. Okay. So, yeah. so I lied I to you. I have a great hedge. I mean, look at those percentages. You beat inflation all those years if you have Bitcoin. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a great, it's a great way to think about it, especially as like a longer term asset. I think that's, that's a good story. Um, and I, I typically lie with the last question because I always think of one more and I, I just lied to you because yeah. I have no, one fine. very last one I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> So for people that are interested in getting involved, mm -hmm. um, do you have any recommendations for them? And the reason why I ask that is I talk to some different people. And for me personally, I've always been kind of an advocate of a platform that gives you like actual direct exposure to holding the currency as compared to indirect exposure, things like that. But I'm curious from your perspective, if somebody is like, I'm curious in Bitcoin, want to get started, what should they do? Yeah, so um, just a couple of things on that. I, I think education, again, is, is number one. And until you understand the problem, you don't appreciate why Bitcoin is a solution, right? So sure. I think first people should look at, you know, their, their financial lives. Are they making enough to be able to comfortably plan retirement or plan a future for their family, for their kids? Are they, are they stressed out financially? Well, if you are, and I would argue that a lot of people feel that way in this country, what are, what's the rate of return you're getting on your investments if you're investing? What's the rate that you got on your stocks? What's the rate you're getting in your savings account or in your 401k? What's that percentage? Now let's compare that to Bitcoin. 
There are so many avenues that you can invest in Bitcoin now, but I agree with you. I think holding Bitcoin directly, becoming your own bank and becoming financially sovereign is the number one. And it is a little bit technology, technologically intimidating for some people because it's the idea of, you know, taking ownership and having something that's completely digital in your custody and you have to protect it. Um, yep. There are also other avenues where there are trusted third parties and multi-sig wallets and all of that that will help you protect your Bitcoin. But number one is just education. Look at your financial yeah. life and, and tell me if, if it's performing the way you want it to. And then let's look at Bitcoin's performance. If you want to read a book about Bitcoin, the best one out there, I've read it countless times now, Bitcoin Standard, number one best book. It's hardly even really about Bitcoin. It's about the history of money and how our system got to be where it is and why we're struggling with some of these issues and why Bitcoin was invented. It is a phenomenal book. It helped get me down the rabbit hole. Um, and then, you know, start investing. That's the best way. Buy Bitcoin, buy $2 worth of Bitcoin, buy $5 worth of Bitcoin, you know, spare the coffee that you would have had and put that money into Bitcoin and watch watch its performance over the next five, six, 10, 12 months. Um, I really just believe, you know, having a little bit of exposure gets you interested and engaged um, doing yeah. the homework, but you know, it's just simple things. How, are you doing well financially? If not, you know, one to 5% is pretty conservative. If it goes, if it goes down, you lost one to 5%. If it does what I believe it will do, you could, you could potentially change your life with it. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I, I have two websites that I recommend personally. I yeah. love Swan Bitcoin. Um, they're a Bitcoin only exchange. They're fantastic. And OKCoin. OKCoin is available in the most amount of countries in the world, has very low dollar cost averaging fees. So basically you can like set up a recurring buy and you don't have to pay fees on it like you do with some other exchanges that are, are big names out there. Um, and so it's really easy. Again, you can buy a dollar worth of Bitcoin. Awesome. That's so awesome. Thanks for going through that too. Cause I know a lot of people are, you know, really curious on, on how to get started. So um, I know you got to run. Thank you so much for sharing some of this information with me. And really more importantly, I, I literally love the fight that you're fighting. It really is kind of the good fight. And I think your focus on just the typical American is it's truly refreshing. So thank you for doing what you do. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Take care, Natalie. Thanks.